We're looking at biblical teaching concerning uh, elders, their work, their qualifications, etc. Uh, as far as the Lord's church is concerned. Tonight's lesson is going to be those that he, he should not possess this. This should not be a part of his life. This should not be something uh, that uh, he's found with. And so we're going to look at those tonight in the same manner that we have been looking at uh, the other qualifications. Again, I remind us that each and every qualification must be met before an individual can be qualified to be an elder in the Lord's church. These things are just that serious. I didn't make them that serious. God did. These are His qualifications. They're not qualifications that our current elders have put in order, nor that I have put in order, but it's what God says on the matter. And that's what counts on everything. It always matters what God says. And we must always be willing to look and accept what God says in the Scripture because God says it. And uh, that, that's given on any subject. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, any subject that we can think of uh, that the Bible pertains to, God's Word settles the issue. Now, I may refuse to accept that. I may say, well, you know, I know God says that, but well, usually with that statement, the ending of that statement is tragic. You know, I can refuse what God says. I can not like what God says. I can walk away and say, I don't want anything to do with the church. I don't want anything to do with God because I don't like what God says on something. I have the free moral agency to do that. But if I choose to do so and remain in such a way, there will be eternal consequences that I will suffer due to that. And so any subject, as well as this subject, falls under the category of whatever God says, that's what's right, and that's what He expects me to do. Now, as we look at these negative as we term them qualifications, both in 1 Timothy on the first one, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3 and Titus 1 and verse 7, not given to wine. Now, the definition behind the phrase here is not given to wine, drunken, quarrelsome over wine, brawling, or abusive. That is, the elder must be refined and discreet in his conduct. Well, being refined and discreet in one's conduct does not involve wine, does not involve alcoholic beverage. Uh, if you've heard me preach concerning this subject matter, uh, you've heard me bring from the Bible the facts that an individual cannot be pleasing to God and be involved in, in uh, drinking as a beverage. Now, the Bible plainly teaches that. So obviously, an elder... A man cannot be in a position to be qualified as an elder if he partakes of such. Because no Christian can be right before God and partake of such according to biblical teachings. And so he looks and this word carries with it the idea of that, that uh, uh, quarrelsome, abusive nature that comes about because of such. Such would be the case whether pertaining to, to wine or otherwise. He shouldn't be this type of, uh, of this type of demeanor whether it involves wine or whether it doesn't involve wine. It's simply this. God withholds the ownership from any man that is given to this. One who is of this nature cannot possibly perform his duties as God has set forth, which require level-headedness, requires patience, and requires wisdom. Well, these two things are opposites. You know, such a demeanor stands opposed to this particular concept. One who practices such should be taught the utter sinfulness of it, and it is inexcusable to put one in as an elder who has thinkings or actions that are otherwise. The second one is found in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 3 and Titus 1 and verse 7 where it says, no striker. The definition of the Greek word here is not a striker, bruiser, ready with a blow, pugnacious, contentious, or quarrelsome. This again has to do with his demeanor. The type of mindset that this individual has. He must not have a mindset that he is what we may term as quick to the trigger. He must have a mindset into which he has a calm demeanor. One that 
uh, when things come his way or come against him or, or don't go in a good way, that he is able to handle it with patience and with wisdom. A striker is one who is ready to resent insult or wrong, whether it is real or whether it is imaginary. Quarrelsome, violent temper. I said, you can't have a man that leads God's people that has this type of thinking and these type of actions that follow up on that thinking. He must have a patient mindset. You know, when we talk about he, he's, he's ready to resent himself, whether real or imaginary. You know, sometimes uh, we, we receive something as being uh, insulting to us when it's not meant that way. Well, one of this demeanor, he's going to jump back at that. And then, you know, it may come to light then that this was not the case at all. How can an individual then have um, a faith in a man who takes out such actions rather than one who patiently looks at this and gives the proper consideration and tries to handle it in a calm manner as God would have him to do? Such a man would be a mis miserable misfit. If you have godly elders and you bring one like this in, then you're going to have trouble first and foremost in the eldership. Because when something doesn't go that person's way or, or it sounds like something was said against it, that person is going to be ready to retaliate. And then you're going to have all kinds of problems in the eldership. And of course, that will spill over into the work of the congregation, no doubt. So he would have problems right at the beginning with his fellow elders and he would have problems with the congregation. Now, the third one we're going to consider, not a brawler. Word carries the idea of contentious in his nature. That's found in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3. Now, the word itself carries the definition of not fighting, not disposed to fight, not quarrelsome or contentious. <coughs> now, you probably have noticed there's a common thread that runs through these first three. And that common thread is the idea of a mindset of an individual who does not have patience. An individual who does not have a calm demeanor, but one who is ready to strike out at someone or something that seemingly does not go his way or as he would desire. Well, there's a reason. I don't know all the reasons why God may have put these three in here. He could have just put one word and maybe have covered this. But the three words carry this idea, this thread in it. Well, possibly God saw fit to come at these different angles because He sees the importance of this matter. Because this is a man who is to be a shepherd to the congregation. And the flock is to look to that shepherd for guidance and leadership or instruction, etc. And how can they do that? How can they have faith? How can they have confidence in an individual who would have such an attitude that is involved in these first three qualifications? It would cause all kinds of trouble. You would have people disturbed in the ownership. You would have people disrupted in the congregation and may end up losing people to congregation splitting, all types of problems because of that. So God saw fit that we need to really, really give consideration to this. Now this doesn't mean that one cannot stand properly for the truth. In fact, an elder has to. He has to stand for the truth. There's no doubt about it. He has to be in a position that he will not back off from the, from the truth. But even as an elder stands for the truth. When there is error and he has to deal with that error, there's still the proper way to deal with that. There's still the mindset that needs to be kept as he deals with such things. So this doesn't mean that he cannot handle and deal with things that are of a false nature. In fact, he must. But it also shows that he has to have a proper mindset in doing it. It seems that some people just love to argue. I mean, they do. It, it just, have you ever come across someone that it seems like all they enjoy is arguing? You know what? I'm just sorry for that person. It's a pitiful condition 
for one to allow themselves to get into. That all they want to do is argue. All they want to do is, is stir up stuff and strife in others or be opposed to others. It's a sad mindset. It has to lead to a, to a life that is filled with, with problems and aggravations and sorrow. It's sad. And the elders should avoid arguments and squabbles and rackets and quarrels, uh, contentions over uh, unimportant matters or even wrongfully handling important matters when it comes to this. Great harm comes when elders have this attitude toward one another, toward the congregation. And so one who's qualified to be an elder must have a peaceful demeanor that goes along with that life. Yeah. Number four, not covetous, meaning a lover of money. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3. And that's exactly the definition of the Greek word there, not a lover of money. Now, the Bible teaches us that money is the root of all evil. Good, I see some heads shaking now. Well, it is the love of money that is the root, literally, of all kinds of evil. The love of money. And that's what he's talking about here, not covetous. This means one who is not devoted to money, to material things. Now, does that mean that for a man to be qualified as an elder of the Lord's church, he has to be poor? No. Doesn't mean that. After all, you find men in the Bible that God highly praises. Now, they're not perfect men, don't get me wrong. But for instance, God. Can you imagine God standing there and telling Satan, Have you seen my servant? God having such confidence in a man and saying, he is a he is a prime example of a follower of me. Well, Job was not a poor person. He was an extremely rich person. But Job was not a lover of money. He wasn't one that such came in between him and his God. Think about Abraham. Do you remember that God said about Abraham, I know him. I know how he will raise up and teach his children in his house. And the Bible talks about the faith of Abraham. Abraham wasn't a poor person. He was a rich person. But he was not a lover of money. You see, there is a difference in the two. You can have someone who is not a rich person. But they can be a lover of money and be wrong in that situation. It's not the amount that we're looking at here. It's not if he has a thousand dollars in his checking account or he has a million dollars. That's not the issue. The issue is, is he a lover of money? One who is not devoted to money. One who's a lover of money will be absorbed and consumed with the matter of money. Now such can come into play and taint his efforts as an elder. For instance, the other elders may be in a constant struggle with this individual. Because, for instance, as an example, you may have a good work that the congregation has an opportunity to help in. And the congregation may be able to say, okay, we have some funds here. And we're going to dedicate the funds to that work so that uh, we, can, we can help God's people or help the word to be spread. And you can have an elder that is a lover of money and says, no, can't do that. We need to hold on to that money. You save it for a rainy day. And this man could be a no man. In other words, a no to any time any money is spent, whether it's prosperous and in a good way or not, that he is such, loves such money, he has such a love of money that he chokes out the endeavors of the congregation to do good. Now, you don't want men in as elders who just flippantly throw the money away either, obviously. But the Lord saw that this could be a problem. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10, we mentioned, for the love of money is the root of all evil, literally all kinds of evil. 
I was reading some comments from Brother Robert R. Taylor. I don't know if any of you have read his works. You probably have or know of him. Uh, Brother Taylor made a statement concerning uh, this. He said, He must not let gold be his God. Silver must not be his Savior. And money must not be his Master. So we're talking about an individual here who allows money to take precedence where it should not. Number five, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 7, the Bible speaks not greedy of filthy lucre. And the original word carries the definition as follows. Greedy of base gain, eager of dishonorable gain. Now that talks about a person who uh, is of such a nature that he will not defraud in gaining material possessions. This deals maybe with the one who is a lover of money, but it also deals with how this person's mindset is as far as the obtaining of stuff. He loves souls and spiritual matters more than he does the gain of material possessions. The Lord teaches us what shall man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. You know, to many, people have no more concern for their soul than to gain a thousand dollars. They'll they'll give their soul away to gain a thousand dollars. They'll give their soul away to have an automobile of this nature or a house or land or a bank account. But the Lord says, he, the Lord in that statement, He went way far above and beyond what any of us could ever have. He didn't say, okay, well here's a particular bank account amount, you know, as long as, as you don't do this. He said, if you could have the whole you lose your soul over it. You've lost it all. Not the puny amounts, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but not the puny amounts that we may get in a lifetime. And puny, I mean in comparison to the whole world, and everything in the world. It's a mighty puny compared to that. The Lord said to you, what shall man profit? He shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. We must love souls. The individual who is an elder, he must love souls. He must care about the souls of men more than he does material matters. One who is the opposite, opposite of this could not possibly have the well-being of the members of the congregation in mind. One who does not love souls above all else cannot be the benefit that he would otherwise be in watching for the souls of the congregation. He cannot be a proper leader, a ruler, an overseer, or a shepherd, as the Bible uses these words, if he is in such a position. Number six, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6, not a novice. The Greek word there is defined as one not newly planted. One not newly planted. In other words, he cannot be fresh as far as being a Christian and knowing God and His will. This implies that he must have experience and that he is not new at living for Christ. After all, one who is new at living for Christ cannot be in the position to have the experience and the knowledge and the wisdom that would be necessary for one to have in overseeing a shepherding flock. Now that doesn't mean that we or God is implied that one who is a new convert, well, they're just a nothing and a nobody. That's not true. Not by any stretch of the imagination because you know what? The Lord gave His life for that new convert. Jesus died on the cross for that new convert just like He did you and me. That's how important they are. But, when it comes to leading and overseeing the congregation as shepherds, one who's a new convert does not possibly 
have the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding to be able to fulfill that as God would have him to do. A person who is lacking in such experience could not possibly assume the awesome task and responsibility that is laid upon an elder in the Lord's church. One may do well in the business world. One may be educated. He may be respected by many, yet be inexperienced in spiritual matters to an extent that he is not qualified as an elder. Now some places have gotten into trouble over this one. Because, you see, they may have an individual in the congregation that has done well in the business world. And that uh, to be respected. You know, they've worked hard, honest, and, and they have done well in the business world. That's respectable. But some people have the idea, well, if they've done well in running a business, they ought to do well in running the church. So let's put them in as an elder, folks. No. Now, there may be a man that does good and has done well in the business world, and he's not a novice, and he is qualified to do a good job. But just because he has accomplished respectable feats in other areas of life doesn't mean he's qualified to be an elder. We have to remember that. Such a one does not have the experience to be apt to teach, to exhort in sound doctrine, to convict the gainsayers, or to stop mouths. He cannot be a leader in spiritual matters that God's people can faithfully follow. Now consider, a man may, may be a member of the church for 20 years, and he still might be a novice. <laughs> Just because he's been a member of the church for 20 years, doesn't mean that that automatic, automatically separates him from the category of being a novice. Because it's possible, hopefully not, but it's possible to have an individual who has been in the church 20 years, but basically has warmed a pew and has not worked to improve in his knowledge and his understanding of Scripture. And he is still a novice. Now we would not want that for anybody, and hopefully it won't be. But what I'm saying is there's a possibility for a man to be there quite a while. And if he has not grown as he should, you know, uh, we're told uh, in Hebrews chapter 5 about some people that they ought to be teachers of the Word. But they have need that someone teach them again what be the first principles of the oracles of Christ. That's people who have been members of the Lord's church for a while and they should have grown. But the Bible says they did not grow. Well, those people couldn't be qualified for an elder they still be considered a novice. But then on the second hand, you may have another individual that has been in the church uh, for less number of years and is no longer a novice. Maybe from day one, he has applied himself to search and study of the Scriptures. He has worked to come to understanding, to educate himself, to learn and grow in the will of God. Where he, while less years than the other, is being a member has worked hard and has placed himself in the position that he's no longer a novice. And if he was in the position where he met the qualifications along with that, then that man could be an elder in the Lord's church. Number seven, in Titus chapter one and verse seven, not self-willed. Now the original word here means self-pleasing, self-willed, arrogant, it denotes one who is dominated by self-interest and is inconsiderate of others. One who arrogantly asserts his own will. Not self-will. You see, the Lord, as far as the ownership is concerned, it is plural. You have a plurality of men that work together in proper respect for God's Word and one another and love for one another in the souls of the congregation to where they work together to accomplish the Lord's will. But if you have a self-willed individual in amongst that, it is going to be trouble. It's going to be problems. <coughs> Some have, or may be familiar with the idea that you cannot have a head elder. You ever heard the terminology head elder? I've heard of it. Unfortunately, I've seen it. 
And I've seen the destructiveness of it. It is a terrible matter. You cannot have one man who asserts his will above the other elders. If this man is inclined to this, he needs to rethink his mindset and he needs to overcome that before becoming an elder. Because there is no room and no place for such. An elder's interest must be with God, number one. And even before himself, he needs to be concerned about the church. Now, I'm not talking about the salvation of his soul, obviously, but, but he needs to be concerned about God first, and he needs to be concerned about the souls of the congregation. As opposed to, I want it this way, or I want it that way. When you were younger, maybe some of you guys were, were in a ball game or something, and and they weren't playing like you wanted to. And it was your bat and ball. So you said, well, you know, if you don't play them that way, I'll take my bat and ball and go home. <laughs> that, the ball game's over then. So what do you want to do? Take your bat and ball and go. We'll go do something else. We'll go fishing. Or ladies, maybe you girls got together. And you have a doll party and you brought all the dolls. Or if you don't play like I want to play, I'll take my dolls and I'll go home. Well, these are childish attitudes. And unfortunately, some people never outgrow them. They never grow up in that respect. And it's always their way that needs to be done. It's always what they want that needs to be. I know of a situation one time. Not here. You don't have to say that, not here. You know, it just aggravates you to have to say that. But they're, they're, it's good in that it's not, though. Don't get me wrong. But I know the situation of where an elder in the Lord's church did not like something. He wanted it his way. It wasn't going his way. His way was not the right way, by the way. It was a wrong way. And the other elders decided, no, we're not going to go that route. And so this man and his wife and his children and their families all stopped their contribution. We'll show them. We'll hit them where it hurts. We'll hit on the budget. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes come judgment. I really wouldn't want to be in their shoes. Because there's going to be some entry to God on that. And it's not looking good. That's sad that someone would have such a mindset that they won't bear with them. I know of another circumstance to where there was something of a good nature and one elder asserted his will on a continual basis. Before it came up in the elders meeting, there were five other men in that eldership that looked at this circumstance, examined it, and said, this is a good thing. This will be good for the congregation. This is something that will be beneficial Something that people in the congregation have wanted and we see that, you know, it's good to be done. It was brought up in the elders meeting and this one elder who was self-willed said, we'll not do that and let's move on to the next thing. And it was canceled. That was that. Not only was this man involved in this self-will, but the other men were cowards. They let him get away with it. That's not an eldership that God's people need. Not self-will. Now this doesn't mean that he cannot take a firm and steadfast stand in his God-given purpose and against things that are wrong and for things that are right. But a man of this nature will wreck an eldership and wreck a congregation if it happen. It cannot be allowed. It cannot be self-will. You know, we all have at times our preferences and, you know, you may sit in a meeting of godly elders and they may look and, and there may be some different preferences there. And they may have discussion back and forth. Well, I, I sort of like this. Well, you know, I don't like it. It doesn't mean that they can't sit there and have their opinions that way and discuss it properly and work through it. This is one who demands his way. And his way is always right. Titus 1 and verse 7, number 8, not soon angry. The definition of the Greek word there is not inclined to anger, passion, prone to anger, 
not soon angry. This is one who flies off the handle, as we say. An individual that might make rash statements or rash actions when something doesn't settle with him. He is quick to make enemies for himself, and he may be quick to make enemies for the church. You know, when you have people outside the church, and you have a man that flies off the handle just very easily, and it works, something goes wrong, and he just flies off the handle. And these people find out that he's an elder, he's a shepherd, he's an overseer, he's a leader in the Lord's church. What are they going to think about the church? They're not going to have that good of an opinion. Well, what about the members? How can the members have a good opinion? If you have a man that, man, if you seem to, to cross him in any way or don't agree with him in any way, he's just going to fly off the handle at you. How can they have a respect and how can they have a desire to follow a leader of such, uh, of such a mindset? Because, and, and I'm not there, so I don't know, but I have been closely related with elderships for over 30 years. And I can guarantee you, as an elder, one is going to encounter problems. He is going to encounter pressures. He's going to encounter <coughs> difficulties like he never dreamed of. And he is going to have to have the proper mindset that he does not allow his anger to explode in such matters. How can you help someone of that nature? How can you help the, the flock? How can you help the sheep if all you do is, is, is go off as such? It may take much prayerful meditation to overcome a quick temper, but if one is to meet the qualifications of an elder, he has to overcome that before becoming an elder. Otherwise, elders' meetings aren't going to be enjoyable. And working with the congregation is not going to be profitable.